he and I were just talking, I had no idea who he was, and he said, oh, well, just between you and me, there's going to be this new show, a show on called Deep Space Nine. And he started telling me about it, and that was about two years before I was on the show, and I thought it was really wonderful then, and I like it even better now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Four or five years old, this would have been the early 70s, watching the show syndicated reruns. The first one I can think of in my memory has to be the Salt Vampire. Oh, the Man, the man Trap. Just because of the strength of that visual image of that monster and the impression it made. Uh, so, yeah, I would have to say yeah, the Man Trap is probably my earliest start. The Man Trap, first episode that aired. How about you, Vic? I remember the first episode I saw was the Tholian Web. Eric, on a 19-inch black and white television after school in Pittsburgh, and uh, I just fell in love. Um, I, uh, my, my parents had just divorced, and my dad was kind of gone, and suddenly there was this handsome, brave... <laughs> <laughs> Captain Enterprise. And I wanted to be him. My mother insane. I, I, I was obsessed. I would take a cassette player every day and put it by the, the speaker of the television and I would record the episode and then it gets weirder. I would put the cassette player under my pillow at night and listen to episodes as I would go to sleep. Consequently, I just digested entire dialogue. My mom used to call it Star Trash. <laughs> Here. I know, I know, and uh, and she, but I got her to teach me to use a sewing machine so I could make my own uniforms, and uh, I would round the kids up in the neighborhood and make Star Trek films. I would spend hours sewing triples so I could make a triple episode, and uh, and I have it was it, I I credit Star Trek with inspiring me to do all the creative things that I do now professionally. And, uh, and I had to tell Bill Shatner that. I couldn't help it. I had to tell him that one day that he really, you know, he started me on a path of creativity, whether it was acting or, or, uh, or production or shooting. Or you like Bill Shatner. He's that type. Did you tell me you made your own triples, though? Oh my God. I made like 70 of those little suckers. <laughs> Don't make triples. This is the lesson we learned. Don't even try. Just buy them somewhere. But it's, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a very pivotal point in my life, and I, I still love it to this day. Well, the thing is, there have been a lot of people who have weighed in, whether they're fans like us, or officials, scientists, politicians, about the enduring appeal of Star Trek. Why has Star Trek not just lasted, but endured, evolved the way it has over the years? And people have said everything like, oh, the place is a positive. Uh, positive depiction of the future where mankind only survived but got rid of so many of its petty uh, pettiness and is reaching out to the stars. And yeah, I, I, I did that answer. That's very cool. But for me, it was about the characters. I just, especially with, with the old show, which I, the first show that I really fell in love with, I just love Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. I love these guys. I felt like I wanted to be just like them. I, I'm not like you are, but I just wanted to be Captain Kirk. I remember, true story, I was uh, in high school, and I went out on a date with this girl named Jill. It was uh, October 18, 1985. And, and we were on this date, and we went and saw this really shitty Jim Carrey movie uh, called Unspit. And anyway, so, so she goes, uh, she says, to me, oh, my local cat's going to look like a woman tonight. So I looked at her and I said, worlds may change, galaxies disintegrate, but a woman always remains a woman. And I got that first kiss, baby. Thank you. 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 Thank Postulated a positive future. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it's the uh, the characters, of, of course, was Kirk Spock and McCoy movie too, are the standouts of the entire franchise. Uh, it was the humanity of these people, I think. It was the allegories of the stories that I think still hold up today. And it was just offering philosophical insights of who we are, where we're going. And I just always clung to that, and I, to this day, I think that to me is the overall deal.
How about you, Chef? Can I just tell you real fast? I have a, a parallel dating story. Okay, I had a boyfriend. Was it a mirror dating story? <laughs> Um, I had a boyfriend who was such a trekkie that I was only allowed to call him during commercials. <laughs> Love this Jeff. Seriously. I know. I wasn't a big on it. No. Oh, I'm sorry now. Um, that's what it's like, and that's why I started watching this Jeff. Um, but, um, I kept watching it. Um, I think it's because the stories are, are so transcendent. They speak to us of how we know that humanity should be. I think the whole convention here, all of pop culture and heroism, speaks to us about how we should live and how we should be treated. I was watching um, The Menagerie uh, a couple nights ago and saw, um, because I'm working with somebody um, named Scott Palm who has a, a vision story on StarCraft.com recently about it that we wrote, and um, somebody who has root palsy, and it brought back the memories of The Menagerie, so I watched that, and how Spock stuck up, even though his life depended on it, for somebody that he know, knows needed help. And as Kirk said, you want to say it? Let me help. I mean, all of those things ring true to us in our hearts about how we know that humanity should be. And it's just, it's transcendent. We need more of that. We need more of it in real life, and I think we need more of it on the screen. You know, I'm so real. Three words. The recommend of even above I love you. Who is this? Where does this person come from? Silly question. Really? You want to hear a silly answer? Sure. First star. <laughs> Just to circle your eyes. Okay. Say it again. What's your take on, on what's your feeling about the Indoor and the I think what helps Star Trek endure is that it's about an idea. And it's about the notion that the power of ideas is greater than the power of arms. That compassion is stronger than the and I think that that's really uh, a watchword that will help humanity go forward. I think that's why humanity has survived the way it has in the Star Trek universe. Now, at the risk of completely derailing, I'll go ahead and say, if you guys had your fun little dating stories, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, my strangest Star Trek memory is the fact that when I was just out of college, I was so poor, I was 43 grand in debt, working an underpaid magazine editor's job. I took a job as a freelance reviewer of X-rated videotapes. <laughs> Specifically so that when I was done reviewing them, I could take over the tabs and use them to record Star Trek The Next Generation. So I was thinking over and said, you know, someday the FBI is going to come in here. And they're going to, the first panic is they're going to see all these porn tapes stacked in the TV. They're going to realize you've erased them all for Star Trek. They're going to think they're even more dangerous than that. <laughs> There's no time the uh, X-rated Star Trek story. Um, you know what I... Those I might be <laughs> just imagine if it would have like gone in and out of the X-rated. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. Like a little bit of X-gen, a little bit of X-rated, a little bit of X-gen. That would have been a different show. Here comes down to the drug. I certainly love the characters. I, I was drawn immediately to the characters and their relationship with each other. But, but for me, I was so enamored with the stories. Um, the stories that discuss ethical questions and moral dilemmas and social issues. And, um, you know, it was, it's funny because when I was a little kid, you know, making a Star Trek film was running around and shooting phaser or flipping up a communicator, or beating down. But as I, as I started wanting to, to get into doing something myself, I wanted it to be those stories. Those stories that just, you know, they just move you. And people are still people. 50 years later, we struggle with the same ethical questions. We have the same moral difficulties. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that this show is timeless, because we struggle with the same things today that they struggled with. And to have presented it as, in such a creative way and an imaginative setting was, uh, was like, it was the perfect blend. I got into a, a, a debate online uh, for the show called Just Seen. It's a movie review series. But there was, they wanted to do a Star Trek versus Star Wars debate. 
So of course I was picked to defend and seek for Star Trek. So me and this guy Kevin, Kevin was a Star Wars guy, went on for about nine or ten minutes, Star Trek versus Star Wars. You say, oh, well, Star Wars made all this money, you got all these people running around with Jedi, some of the stuff, all this garbage. So I said, hey, hang on, hang on. Star Trek was about something. Star Trek had something to say. Star Trek was philosophical. And how many of the best Star Trek episodes serve as allegories for not those times, but for our times now, why they still endure. Like you watch an episode like Bounds of Terror, which was a take on the Cold War on Vietnam, could easily be a take on what's going on like in Iraq and Afghanistan too. That's why an episode like that still holds up. And within that episode, as if it wasn't enough that they were dealing with the Romulans, you have a navigator who, who is totally uh, a red-blooded bigot. And I love that scene on the bridge when uh, Kurt says, uh, we're gonna make bigotry in your quarters, so we'll move for it here on the bridge. It's a great scene. But stuff like that, that is why, why I, I think, like Nicole, what you're saying, why Star Trek pulls up so well. But I just love asking this question. When push comes to shove, hands down, of any of the Star Trek shows, including, yes, the animated series, what is your favorite single Star Trek episode ever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> single favorite. Not like, oh, I like this and this and this. What's the one? It's a cliche sitting in the end of the room. But it's a good cliche. Why? And you got to see Kirk torn apart emotionally in a way we've never seen before since. Mm -hmm. This is that last scene when they come back through the Guardian and they're all happy. Oh, they're back. And who goes back to? With a look on Kirk's face with his jaw clenched. Let's get the hell out of here. First swear word on television, I believe. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so Kirk said the Enterprise is up there calling and wanting to know if we want to be up. And Kirk said, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. Chase Masterson, what is yours? I think we have to be Dr. Bashir this week because I have to kiss a Marini. That's a good one! Yeah. Yeah, very awesome. I love the movie series really. And um I, I there's there each of the person each of the series has its own personality, so they're they're uh, it does have so that's that's what's great about it. It's hard to choose. And I love how each space did something. It it, oh, it it was it was like a flip of, of Star Trek and, and this really hit its stride where the original show like died in its first season. DS9 really hit its stride in its first season. That's what's great about DS9. I don't really know that it died. Did you know she died in its first season? Well, did you see Spock's brain? Did you see how your children shall leave? Did you see the way to eat it? Oh! Oh, I'll be never again. But they did have the way, but without you, David. Well, first, first you for making us reduce it to just one out of yeah, seven yeah. hundred. <laughs> uh, I'll go with Deep Space Nine: The Visitor, just because Ooh. it's such a hard time. I love to see a father and a son, uh, a father who, in the beginning, is willing to sacrifice himself for the son, and then the son gives himself to the father. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Mr. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Okay. Hey. <laughs> I can't um, <laughs> The way the eagle is my favorite. I see it all. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. um, <laughs> um, my favorite episode was Requiem from Methuselah. I hate that. From the third season. <laughs> Who said that? I did. Dan, you said Oh, we're going to have to talk. Go ahead. I'm going I'm to win you over. <laughs> um, and you know what it was about it was um, the last three minutes when Raina collapses because she she can't deal with she's not ready to deal with the contradictions of loving someone as a father and loving someone as a lover and having to choose between them. And it just tears her apart. And those lines at the end of that episode, I mean when she falls down and, and Kirk looks up at Spock and says, What happened? And Spock says, She loved you, Captain. And you too, Mr. Flint. As a mentor, even as a father. There wasn't enough time for her to reconcile with awful contradictions of her newfound emotions. She couldn't bear to hurt either of you. The joys of love made her human, and the agonies of love destroyed her. And I just started sobbing. <laughs> and then, at the last the last Kirk is sitting there, feeling humiliated about his behavior. When do we ever see 
Kirk sitting there going, we put on a pretty poor show today. He was, he was embarrassed by the way he behaved. If only I could forget. And McCoy is some of the best lines in the, in, 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 that McCoy ever said. When, when he says to Spock, Kirk falls asleep and he says, you know, Spock, I feel sorrier for you than I do for him. <laughs> because you'll not know the things love can drive a man to. The dress desperate chances, the glorious failures, the glorious victories. <laughs> All these things you'll never know, simply because you love this thing to your book. Should we just put the on? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like, but where do you think Star Trek should go after that? 
Like, it can't just be movies. How many of you agree with me that Star Trek belongs on television? I would ideally like to see uh, Star Trek, the third one, comes out. <laughs> uh, uh, to see that crew of the Enterprise, obviously with new actors, back on television and continuing the voyages, basically. Uh, that would be my idea for the future Star Trek. I agree that Star Trek belongs on television uh, largely because of the intimacy that happens when stories appear in your living room. You know, I mean, you get to have that as part of your home, and there's a relaxedness there that you don't have when you're in the theater. And I think the stories are so beautifully absorbed. You know, I mean, and, and it's kind of like a mystery where the people, the storytellers, or the actors, or the people that get to lead an audience into laughing or crying or hugging your children or writing that letter or seeing the world in a more dimensional Multi, um, just a, a just a, a, a more thorough atmosphere. So I agree that she had television for that reason. I think it would be really interesting to do a Section 31 series, um, showing. I've heard that a couple of times. I think that showing the um, the lighter and darker side of heroism and the fact that your enemy is not always so one-dimensional. And, and again, that there is no them, there's only us, there are so many different sides to stories. I think it's a very Star Trek thing. Um, just the diversity that you could play into that, especially in these times of tumultuous stuff and, and uh, you know, um, I, I'm separating here, but if anything that's going on in the Middle East and our own country, there's so much need for understanding of what we perceive to be the other. And isn't that what Star Trek is about? Absolutely. It's about getting together. I agree that Star Trek needs to be back on television because A, that's where it started, and it's always been ideally suited to a television format. It's about people who have a job, who have a mission. And movies, I think, although they are fun, they're big, they have spectacle, I don't think they've served Star Trek very well in all cases because they do tend to reduce stories to spectacle and often to binary issues. Whereas Star Trek on television was able to examine much more complex ideas over a much longer period of time. Where I will disagree with you is I don't think a Section 31 series would necessarily be the best way to go because I think Section 31 is kind of like the preview. You want a little bit of spice, but you don't want that to be the whole meal. I think it would be a little bit dark, and I don't think it represents the best of what Star Trek is about. I think that a new Star Trek series would be very difficult to do with a movie cast just for budgetary reasons. But I think that it would be great to sort of go back and maybe even just reinvent, rethink, uh, bring it back to television in some way, maybe take advantage of the fact that audiences are now accustomed to serial storytelling. Uh, they're used to you know, narratives that will stretch over a season, stretch over the length of a, a series as a whole. I think they should probably consider bringing it down to 10 to 13 episode seasons, do it in more of a premium format, maybe look at a premium network like Showtime or something like that, where they maybe have slightly larger budgets and a little bit more creative freedom. But generally, just for the sake of being able to explore more complex ideas over a longer form of storytelling, definitely has to come back to television. I think, on top of maybe doing it something like Showtime, what about Netflix? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I am including the animated series. Some of those episodes when they did find live action shows. But yeah, listen, I've got all the Blu-rays for the original show for the next gen. I got all the other DVDs for all the other shows. But when I when I sit down and I watch Star Trek, I put on Netflix. It's right there. It's right there. Is this something CBS would do or could do? I mean, yeah. I don't know. I I hear. I'm asking. I don't know. Very 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 crazy rumors. But it's been discussed to an extent. Uh, I, I can't say anything more than that because I don't know anything more than that. But Nick, what do you think? Where does Star Trek need to go? Or would you like to see it? I, I you're already doing it! 
Is that kind of about going to see William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy hopefully together again even for the 50th anniversary? But I also have a concern for these films that they're still relying too much on the original series in the sense that if you're going to be in a reimagining of Star Trek and going forward, then go forward. Don't bring Khan back. Don't bring the spot back. Do your own thing and establish Star Trek for this generation. to establish Star Trek for this generation. One of the great things about the show is that people of all such achieve but all ages love it. I mean, there are grandparents that watch the show when they were younger, young, and there are kids that are named after the characters. It's so cool. Hi, Jessina. Hi. Oh, you And they started all of this, and I guess the purist in me wants to say they're using Chatner, who I love, and I think he's come a long way in his understanding of fandom and all that stuff. I have a lot of respect for him now. Um, I think they should use George, because he was such an incredible person. He was such an incredible person, and Ray Bird, and Michelle, obviously. What an amazing human being she is, and the character that did so much. And then you go, and okay, then Walter, and, and, and obviously, so what, where do you draw the line? I mean, these guys are all, I don't know, essential. I know that it is. I'm sorry. I just think it would be really cool to keep what, what the original series had and stood for. I almost just like to see that. I'm well, certainly not going to second guess what Roberto Orsi might do three years from now or two years from now. I, it all comes down to execution. You can have the best idea in the world, but if you execute it badly, it's not going to work. You could have a so-so idea, but if you execute it brilliantly, you raise it to the level of art. Uh, so I'm going to withhold judgment until I actually see what he does. I'm all for it. If he wants to bring Chapter in, Chapter wants to be part of it. I think it's a great way to tie history together. I do agree that maybe they have relied a little bit heavily on fan service and uh, nostalgia. I think they've been riding too much on nostalgia for the first couple of movies. I agree that they should carve out their own niche, establish their own identity. Um, we're going to have to wait and see. I'm hoping Roberto Orsi will do that. I'm hoping he'll have the artistic courage to do it and the freedom to do it. And if he does, then I will applaud him and I will love that movie. Dick? The thing that I love the most about the new movies is that they, they introduced Star Trek to a new generation of people. Yes. And you know what I love the most? What I love the most is that it encouraged people to go back and watch the original series. That literally seeing the new movies made them wonder where this all came from. It was a game. And they literally right. <laughs> Like the source. And, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and I, I do a lot of voice work for animated shows and video games, and one of my favorite things is for a 13, 15 year old uh, family to come up and say, My dad made me watch the original series with him, and I love it. Um, to see the way that, that parents are passing on their lifelong love for the original series is wonderful and young younger kids are getting are still enjoying the original series 45 50 years later i i don't know what to expect from these movies because let's be fair they're making them to make money right i mean that's not a bad thing but let's just well, okay, well, I get it. Well, but stop. I, but I'm very well. I'm very well. Sure. No, of course. But my point is, they, they they're making them for a broad audience to have as much appeal as possible. So invariably, hardcore Star Trek fans are probably going to find fault and you know and feel like it doesn't meet up to their expectations. But but the, these movies are not being made for the hardcore Star. They're not being made for the two percent. They're being made for a large audience. And whatever gets people to look back and enjoy what has already been made, I, I applaud that. And I'm glad to hear that Bob Orsi is a, 
is a Star Trek, is a, is a Star Trek thing. I've heard that J.J. is something. <laughs> he is so good with knowledge. There you go. But he loves Star Wars, so those movies are probably really good. <laughs> right? So I'm glad to hear that Bob Rosie, regardless of his experience, I'm glad to hear that the BC has a, a, a love for the original series. And it's interesting to see how it pans out. Chase. Oh, I just wanted to say real fast because I know I'm coming home with stuff. Um, I'm starting, uh, uh, one of the things I love about Trek is that it does segue into real life. It's not just a television show. There's so many things that you guys do that you really, truly care about the world. And, and um, I, uh, I, I'm putting together an initiative called Star Trek IRL. Of course, we have TOS, TNG, DS9. You know why in the And I think it's time for Star Trek in real life when we take these stories and we do things that matter in the real world because it has such an incredible power in our in our in our fan base and I know that you guys love these stories because you care about the world. So um, I would love to just keep you guys posted. There's an article on StarTrek.com that I wrote about it with a man who has cerebral palsy and we're gonna do some work. Um, we brought him uh, a fan effort brought him to the Vegas convention. We're gonna do some more stuff for people who need us. So um, I don't know. I just wanted to put that out there and, and follow us on Twitter. If you want to email us our Twitter handles or whatever. Um, <laughs> Need your help too. Yeah, this is really self-serving now after that one. But, uh, <laughs> you know, as, as Scott mentioned at the beginning, I'm co-writing with Marvel in uh, a book called 50 Year Mission, which is to complete all the history of Star Trek. And because of the format, I'd like to put it out there. If anybody's life has been impacted by Star Trek in some way or another, and you'd like to submit it to us, uh, we would love to, the possibility of printing some of those in the book as part of the oral history because we do want to see how Star Trek impacted our regular people. So uh, if you do want to send something, please send it to 50yearmission uh, 50, 50 at gmail.com. 50 is spelled out, it's not the number. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. All right, turn around, turn around. Doesn't this guy look like Chris Pine? <laughs> Okay. I mean, that's a He wins. <laughs> What's the ladies and gentlemen? Thank you for helping us launch the 50th anniversary of Star Trek right here in this room. Thank you very